Today we'll be going over the understanding and management of shock. Shock is not a new concept and we are well versed in its clinical presentation and the pathophysiology so the purpose of this talk is for us to not only review the known pathophysiologic um, abnormalities resulting in the clinical syndrome of shock but to also go over the well-documented but perhaps less known uh, concepts of shock. The presentation outline will be as follows. We'll first go into defining shock and then we'll classify the different types of shock that we commonly see. Hypovolemic shock is the most common type of shock we see in veterinary medicine so the remainder of the talk involving the pathophysiology, therapy, and supportive care will be based around specifically hypovolemic shock and then we'll end with controversial issues. So shock is a common clinical condition, especially if you do a lot of emergency and critical care work. There are many causes of shock. And the syndrome is a clinical diagnosis based on a multitude of parameters based on physical examination. If left untreated, shock can lead to multiple organ failure and death. Ultimately, the underlying problem of shock is that there's a failure of the cardiovascular system to deliver oxygen to the cells. The definition of perfusion is the ability of the circulatory system to distribute blood to organs and tissues. So shock then, by definition, would be a global perfusion breakdown where there is no oxygen and metabolite delivery to the cells and also no removal of the waste products from the cells like carbon dioxide. So if hypoperfusion is a cardiovascular system breakdown resulting in poorly perfused tissues, the types of shock that we have can be defined based on where exactly the problem is within the cardiovascular system, either with the heart itself, the blood vessels, or what the blood vessels carry. The types of shock that we'll briefly talk about are cardiogenic shock, distributive shock, and hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic shock is, dis is a disorder impairing the heart's job as a pump. So the most common conditions we see would include heart muscle disorders like dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or restrictive cardiomyopathy. There can also be structural abnormalities like severe mitral valve disease or endocarditis. Electro condu electrical conduction problems like severe arrhythmias can also impair the heart's ability to act as a pump. Obstructive shock is a subset of cardiogenic shock where there is obstruction to delivery of normal blood flow. This is an example of a pericardial fusion with uh, radiographs here showing a severe cardiomegaly. The pericardial fusion causes cardiac tamponade. Another example of obstructive shock could theoretically be pulmonary thromboembolism. Distributive shock or vasodilatory shock is a problem primarily within the blood vessels. So it's the problem is best shown through the equation of where blood pressure is equal to cardiac output, which is the volume of blood that's ejected from the heart, and the peripheral vascular resistance, which determines normal vascular tone. If there is problem with the blood vessels primarily and peripheral vascular resistance goes to uh, zero, then understandably blood pressure will also be negligible as peripheral vascular resistance decreases. Examples of distributive shock include any systemic inflammatory conditions most commonly seen would include sepsis, severe pancreatitis, as shown in these slides here, neoplasia, and extensive tissue trauma. Hypovolemic shock is by far the most common cause of shock we see in veterinary medicine, and the primary problem here is a loss of circulating volume. Causes of hypovolemic shock can be hemorrhage, gastrointestinal loss through vomiting and diarrhea, renal loss, or extravascular redistribution. Uncommon causes of shock can be due to failure to utilize oxygen, so like cyanide, cyanide toxicity or the failure to physically bind 
oxygen, like carbon monoxide poisoning in these two examples, then uh, they are not dependent on an inadequate oxygen delivery. Oxygen delivery is ad adequate. It's a failure at the cellular level to actually um, uptake oxygen or to bind oxygen. Going into the pathophysio pathophysiology of shock, the remainder of this talk will primarily be focused on hypovolemic shock. So with hypovolemia, there's a decreased blood volume resulting in decreased venous return to the right side of the heart. Decreased venous return results in a decreased stroke volume. Decreased stroke volume then decreases cardiac output and ultimately decreased cardiac output leads to decreased tissue perfusion. The understanding of this outline in the pathophysiology of shock will help us recognize and interpret our clinical signs and also then to help support therapy. The body does have a few favorite organs and during shock the cardiovascular system will shunt blood towards those that are favored and those that will keep the body alive being the brain and the heart and sacrifice the organs that can temporarily have a, a, le less of a blood supply like the skin, gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas, and the kidneys. Even though temporary shunting of blood is beneficial to the body, some of the organs don't react in a beneficial way for the body like the pancreas. The pancreas in a hypoxic condition tends to release myocardial depressant factor. Myocardial depressant factor is not known at this time uh, as to its exact um, identity. Some believe or most believe that it, it is likely due actually inflammatory cytokines. The site of action for myocardial depressant factor is the heart and the consequence of that is that it will decrease the strength of the cardiac contractions and will also increase um, the chances of arrhythmias. So the outcome of this is that in a setting of shock, uh, when myocardial depressant factor is present, it will further depress the heart's ability to work effectively as a pump and exacerbate the low oxygen supply to all the cells. Perhaps you need to trauma and hemorrhage. What we know is that trauma and hemorrhage triggers the immune system and increases inflammation through secondary messengers, uh, gene expression, and neutrophil activation. Unfortunately, through this maladaptive response, the protective role of the host immune response is lost. Immune dysfunction then can, can then lead to post-traumatic multiple organ failure, and sepsis, which accounts for most of the late deaths after trauma. Knowing this pathophysiology response, then the aim of the research is um, twofold towards treatment, not only to one, restore the circulating volume, but also to try to ameliorate this immune and inflammatory effects of trauma and hemorrhage. The body has several compensatory mechanisms which will go over. The purpose of these compensatory mechanisms are to dampen the falling intravascular volume and improve the impaired oxygen delivery to the cells. The compensatory mechanism is primarily triggered through the sensation of falling blood pressure. So hypotension, as defined as a systolic pressure of less than 80 or mean arterial pressure of less than 60, will trigger the body's compensatory mechanisms and the sensors then lie primarily within the baroreceptors of the aortic and carotid arteries. There are three main defenses against shock. Our baroreceptors, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, and antidiuretic hormone. So with the baroreceptors within our body, the body normally is in a state of homeostasis where blood pressure is in the normal range. When the body senses an imbalance, where the blood pressure falls. And this imbalance is sensed by the baroreceptors in the carotid and aortic arch. And this then will do two things. It will stimulate the vasomotor center of the brain, and this will increase the vasomotor fiber, causing vasoconstriction, resulting in an increased peripheral vascular resistance. Also through the brain, the sympathetic efferents will stimulate an increased heart rate and contraction, 
resulting in increased cardiac output. Both increased cardiac output and increased peripheral vascular resistance will help return blood pressure to the homeostatic range. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is also can also be stimulated through the baroreceptors. So the kidneys will sense blood pressure falling, and as it does so, it will release renin. Renin will convert the angiotensinogen within the blood to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will then circulate through the cardiovascular system and with the help of angiotensin converting enzyme, primarily residing in the lungs, will be converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 then has two effects. It is a direct vasopressor on itself and will help the blood pressure increase. Angiotensin 2 will also then work on the adrenal glands to produce aldosterone. Aldosterone will cause the kidneys to retain salt and as a secondary cause the kidneys to retain water, again helping to ameliorate um, a falling blood pressure. Finally, the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, it can also be stimulated by baroreceptor uh, response to a falling blood pressure. Antidiuretic hormone is produced in the pituitary gland and can do again two things. It will cause a direct vasoconstriction on the vessels itself, increasing arterial blood pressure. Antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin will also work on the renal tubules and cause water retention which will increase blood volume and again 